What's up, Portland? John Taylor, founder of PortlandRealEstateExperts.com. And I'm Christina Bullock, co-founder of PortlandRealEstateExperts.com. And we are your host for the show that brings you interesting people talking about what makes them unique, what makes Portland unique, and why Portland is such a great place to live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the All Things Portland podcast. I'm John Taylor, your host, along with my lovely co-host, Christina Bullock, and we have two exciting guests today, Jerry Brazy. He is a husband, a father, a friend of mine, and a successful entrepreneur, along with Billy Green, and he is a podcast producer, The Jerry Brazy Show, and a real estate investor, and also a friend of mine, so... They're here to talk to us today a little bit about what it takes to uh, become successful in business and when starting from nothing. And uh, so, welcome. Yeah, Thanks welcome, guys. Us. Happy to be yeah. here. So, John knows a little bit about, or John knows way more about your story than I do. I was fascinated when I read your bio today. And uh, just to learn about what you guys have done with your podcast as well. So, I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say today. And without further ado, let's jump into your story, Jerry. Yeah, tell us a little bit about your journey from, you know, where you started from and to where you're at today, because it's, it's definitely a fascinating... Uh, the, the short story, I'm born and raised here in Portland. Uh, excuse me, I was born in Medford, but been in Portland since I was one year old. Uh, I am the seventh child of nine. Uh, my older six brothers and sisters are less than a year apart on average. My parents had six kids when they were 22 years old. And so uh, seven years later, I came along, and then they didn't want me to be an only child, so I have a little brother and a little sister. Uh, and so we grew up, as you can imagine, poor uh, here in Portland, uh, mostly in Northeast. Uh, and I was a street kid at 17, living in Northwest Portland in a flop house with hookers and heroin addicts uh, for $25 a week, sharing a bathroom just like out of a bad 70s uh 70s movie, uh, yeah. you know, the, right down to the no shade on the lampshade, um, oh. and sharing a bathroom, like I said, <laughs> And that was down my choice, or just the only thing you could afford? It's the only thing I could afford, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, when I was, you know, my story is a lot of violence, um, a lot of fighting. This is, you know, when I say fighting back in the day, it wasn't like, you know, everybody's MMA trained, you know, John's into that big time. It was just whoever could punch the hardest and, 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 and outlast the other Take guy. the hardest punch. It, yeah, it was just that kind of, or who was the biggest and, you know, could get you on the ground and that sort of thing. So I always say nobody ever won any fights, but it's just a different life that I grew up in. Um, I was, by late 16, early 17, I was on my own. And mm -hmm. the one thing I knew how to do, I went to work when I was 11 years old. And so as an 11-year-old, I paid taxes at a local restaurant where I washed dishes. Uh, and from then on, work and food always went together. So I was able, because I stole food as a kid, as an 8, 9, 10-year-old with mm -hmm. my little brother, we would steal food to eat. Uh, and so when I was able to go to work for myself at 11, uh, I quickly realized that I had money now to buy food and those two things went together for me and so that I think cemented a work ethic for me uh, that essentially put me where I where I am I've not missed a day of work since mm -hmm. uh, so I just go to work it's all I you know you learn that early and that's all I know how to do and that's ultimately what got me uh, off the streets along the way I've you know when I was 13, my older sister died on her 21st birthday from, uh, from a heart disease. When I was 14, I went blind in my right eye. Um, the stories wow. just continue. When I was 18, yeah. I had a dumpster fall on me from the second story after I fell off of it. Um, and I've had 13 back procedures ever since. So I've had just tremendous adversity. And I say that Trauma. as part of my story, yeah. uh, only to say, yeah, I saw three murders, four suicides by the time I was 21 years old. I didn't think I'd lived past 21 years old, um, but I was smart in that I knew how to work. And so the time I spent working mm -hmm. kept me away from doing the things that I would otherwise do. Um, and so that's, so I just went from job to job. I probably had I could probably name 25 jobs, which means I probably had 30 jobs. Right. And every job I had, I just, I, I never lost a job. I just went from one job to another if they would pay me more money. What was your first job? I was washing dishes, uh, Fat City Cafe in Southwest Portland when I was 11 years old, Saturday morning, 6.30. 
Uh, and, and, and they paid me, I believe I made $2 and, or I'm, I believe I made $2 and 35 cents an hour. Don't quote me on that if I, I, I can't, I, somewhere in there. My check was $17 and change. And they wrote me a check at the end of the day minus taxes. And I went down to the corner market uh, around the street and cashed it and got all ones. Because to me, rich that guys carry big. that. You <laughs> know what I was going to say? Yeah, they carry that fat. So I could just sit there and hammer off those Make bills. It rain. And anybody that lives in Portland knows uh, Oaks Park. And so on down to Oaks Park, I went, having never had money in my life, and essentially spent all of the money that night. How did you uh, show up to work? Like, what uh, did you did you have family members that took you? Or you yeah, my my sister was a uh, a waitress at the restaurant, so uh, I had a connection there. My mother worked at the restaurant, so I. I had a connection there and so they brought me on I left that job the next I left that job eight months later and went to work at International House of Pancakes uh, downtown oh, yeah. because they let me work Saturday and Sunday I was there at six o'clock every morning Saturday Sunday as a 12 year old took the bus downtown uh, and worked full days and they paid me a quarter more so I got a quarter more uh, and I got two days instead of one day this restaurant was closed on Sunday mm -hmm. uh, so that was the first eight months into it I moved to the next job and that kind of set the stage for what I did. I've done every job you can imagine. Uh, and each time I moved, for the most part, it was because I got paid more money. Did you ever pick strawberries? Oh, I picked strawberries. Got on the bus. <laughs> yes. Got, it was picking strawberries. Yeah, strawberries to this day. Yeah, so picking strawberries. strawberries is a nightmare. The worst job I had, I did it for a month. I set chokers. Uh, and it's setting chokers. The if you think about logging, that zip line comes up, yeah, right from oh. from from either yeah. below or above, uh, and somebody's got to be down there to dig up underneath the the, the tree that's right. fallen. Uh, and then the choker comes down and you set that choker and it zips the line Super off. Super dangerous, the, right? Oh my God. And yeah. so you're dealing with dudes with, you know, no fingers and, oh and we would, <laughs> you got to wait for the choker to come back. And so we would sit, there would be a fire it'd be up in Vernonia and you know, just 14 degrees and freezing cold. And you're trying to keep your fingers warm that you need now to set the <laughs> right. choker. I did that about 30 days and I was like, mm, yeah, that's well, I feel like for me. Men have like the last worst, first job. <laughs> Um, yeah. Mine was at Conroy's Flowers. Yeah. I got to pick out pretty flowers for yeah. people. I just don't have these horror yeah. stories. What about you, Billy? First job. first job. I worked for my grandparents for up until I was 18, and then I started at Fred Myers. So. Yeah. But what? working for them, I'd do all kinds of house repairs and yard maintenance okay. and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Hard manual labor. And then yep. What did you do at Fred Meyer? Uh, started as a cart pusher three months in, got moved up to the food department and then was trained in every department. Okay. So nice. it's kind of just yeah. an all around go to person there. Yeah. Very nice. Part of the success part of success or or attaining success, particularly where I came from, is in that hard work, but also the, the lessons that it can teach you along the way. I worked and did the same thing at Safeway uh, and Cub Foods, now QFC, for about a year. But I worked at McDonald's when I was 16 years old. And I have my IT director worked with me at McDonald's when he was 16 years old. And my best friend is works for me, has for 30 years. And he, when we were 16 years old, so we met and we stayed together. But also lessons I learned working at McDonald's mm -hmm. for $3.00. 35 cents an hour, whatever it was, minimum wage when I was 16, I use today in my business and have used today organizationally in yeah. my businesses today. So it's not just that crappy McDonald's job to pay the bills during the summer. There are real lessons that come out the of those system. jobs. And I, again, huh. we're, we're almost to $500 million in revenue. And I use lessons I learned doing that working at McDonald's. Absolutely. Or lessons I learned from McDonald's. Uh, I apply to my business every day and have for 20 plus years. So I have a question. Um, what do you think that drive was back in the day when you were young? I mean, I thought I had it bad when I turned 15 and a half and my mom made me work the next day. I mean, 11 is insane. And to know that you had to steal for food and stuff. What kept you on that path from keeping the work path versus jumping in and stealing. And, and I know you said that's what kept you from, but I mean, it's very easy for people nowadays to just say, that's actually hard work. Yes. I'm going to go try and steal because that's quick, that's easy, and I get what I want immediately, essentially, if that's, you know, whatever that. I say all the time that I should be dead or in prison. Mm -hmm. I should not be sitting here with you guys doing this. Uh, and I say that because... 
if not for a person who entered my life when I was in the, going into the seventh grade. Got it. And so as I came into the seventh grade, I met my seventh grade teacher. Uh, and he had two little girls. My sister died. Uh, and his family, without hardly even knowing me, took me in because I wasn't in my family, picked up and moved to Montana. Got it. Right? Okay. I'm living in northeast yeah. Portland. I'm not moving to tiny town right. Montana uh, and so they let me live with them so now I ran that welcome out after about nine months but for a school year right. uh, and part of the summer I got to live with these guys and uh, and he played catch with me and took me to softball games and uh, took me on vacation I've never been on vacation before the course of uh, life. I'm a Dodger fan yeah. today huge because he's from Southern California mm -hmm. and so having him enter my life uh, and just show me what reality could be like sorry guys show me what the world can look like mm -hmm. and what some sort of normalcy would look can look like really put that in the back of my head I didn't hockey stick it I didn't all of a sudden I became an altar boy right they had to throw me out because I got in a fight with cops and egged their car and uh, you know that didn't want to come get me out of jail so that was it and I deserved all of that but what it did is it started me on a trajectory that you just that that, that is hard to get from the street uh, and so learning uh, or seeing how that worked um, it probably didn't take effect for 10 years Right. Maybe 15 years, but at some, maybe 10 years, but at some point in the future, as I started up, rather than just going straight, I, I like to say that I was a rock that I skipped off. And so rather than going underneath and going that direction, I kind of skipped and, and, and come off. Where the, the most telling story I, I, I say about that that I learned from him is, is a conscience. Mm -hmm. And on two separate occasions, uh, I had been in fights in downtown Portland, and I had my boot up. And I'm ready to bring it down on top of yeah. the guy's head. I mean, it's over. You've already won the fight, right? Right. I've been in the same spot in this case. Facing shot. Yeah. And, and something, and I'm 16, 17, 18, and just full of rage, and, you know, I'm yeah. a big guy. Uh, and something told me, enough. Don't do it. Stop right there. Two mm -hmm. separate times, like someone was standing right there. Yeah. And that's the difference between you've done enough, Jerry. You go any further, you're never coming back. You're crossing there, that right? line. You're, you're yeah. crossing that line. Uh, so that would be my answer is I was lucky enough to have somebody come into my life that just over a nine month period steered me a little bit off course. Yeah, that's, in, yeah. I Wait. think that's part of what you talk about generational poverty all the time. And that, that's something that you've broken out of. I think that's part of that whole situation is if you were grown up in generational poverty and that's how you know how to live life. That's yeah. how you know how to survive. That's all you're used to. That's what you project on then right. to your further down generations. And it's real hard to... That's yeah. what I find fascinating, you know, hearing that you made that switch or just under, trying to understand what, why one person makes one choice and why you made the choice you did and now you're where so, you are yeah, today. Yeah, so, so I was going to ask you. So you have eight siblings. Yep. And so... And they came up in the same situation. Any of those go the other way? I think for the, I mean, I have a brother that went in the military, uh, got in the drug trade, spent time at Leavenworth. Um, most of my, I have three, I have three brothers, five sisters, one sister is gone. The thing is, my brothers, you know, we all got into trouble, JDH and McLaren and, you know, when you're young and then now they own construction companies, but the drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. and, um, I never did any of that. I didn't like the taste of beer, so I didn't drink it. And I was independent. Mm -hmm. When you grow up like that, it's easy to follow the crowd, but one of the things about me is I was just independent. So when people said, here, have some beer, I don't know that anybody likes beer the first time they drink it, right? You're kind of doing no, it because it's a cool thing to drink. I didn't at all. I yeah. said, no, And I was like, you. this tastes like gas. I'm not drinking yeah, this. No. Uh, and, and really, I'm not a drinker. Uh, I've never done drugs. I, I just never got into that um, because I didn't like how it made me feel. Uh, it's hard to do that, though particularly where we come from. And so my brothers and sisters, for the most part, um, have gone their separate ways and gotten into trouble. But now we're all older, uh, and so they've started, they're starting to see some success. But like my sisters all got married as teenagers, got pregnant as teenagers. I have friends whose mothers had them at 16, who they had kids at 15, who their kids had kids at 15, and yeah. now that kid's going to be pregnant. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's been And I don't even have grandkids. Yeah. You're talking about great grandmas, right? Right. So I mean that that yeah. to Billy's point, that institutional poverty just keeps it kind of just keeps, keeps going. going. It's you really hard to not, jump off of it. I mean, it I know is. I have a, in my family there's some, so 
But um, you don't know another way. Like it's hard to. Yeah, and it's because, and it's. it's I always say, if, it, if it's easy, uh, everyone does it. If it's hard, no one does. Yeah. And the right thing is always the hard thing. Right. So fast forward to today, you have thousands of employees. You've gone way above and beyond of what you probably should have and could have. Sure. Um, what do you think of of people today, and uh, how do you? How do you talk to someone today about my, someone might be in that same situation or how, how you've gotten to where you are today? What, what, keeps, what keeps your drive? Yeah, you know, that's you had a great that question. hunger and food on the table, kept, yep. kept the drive back then. Now you're super successful and you have been for years. So, how do you keep it? I know, like Michael Jordan talked about, he had to create these little. Uh, enemies in his mind that weren't even there these rivalries but yeah that, so how do you how do you keep that going there, there's a there's a part of that i'd love to sit here and say it's just all day every day i want to crush the world mm -hmm. but it's not after you know what's the average business is in business for a couple of years we're going to be this is our 22nd year mm -hmm. uh, i bought and sold a dozen companies over all those years and what happens when you have some success and you have money um, it's easy to get lethargic. I make more money in my business running my business efficiently than I do selling new business. There's always money to be made uh, that you get that goes right to the bottom line. But when you make money, all of a sudden you feel like I can do no wrong. Sit right? back a little. Sit back relax. a little bit. How bad can this be compared to where I come from? And so you do have to battle that. But I will say that that the Michael Jordan analogy is perfect because that's what you do. And I try. And Billy will tell you this, I never lose perspective. Mm -hmm. I always remember where I come from. So no matter how many, the flip side to it is no matter how bad work is uh, and no matter what, because in any size, in good size business, you're going to have all kinds of issues. Right. All kinds of issues. And dealing with those issues the correct way is critical. Right. And for me, I just, re I used to steal food. How bad can it be? Right. <laughs> I mean, how, well, what can you do right. to me? What can you throw at me? Yeah. The other thing too is I'm not scared of being poor. I know what poor is. I, I, I know what poor is on a level that a lot of people don't know what it is. Right. And so it doesn't scare me. So I have no fear. I understand that. Um, I, I'm not risk averse, as John knows, Been there, at all. Done that. And it's it cost me, I've lost, I've lost fortunes, mm -hmm. but I've made fortunes, right? right? And so uh, that's a big part of it too. Yeah, I think that's huge. So on a, on kind of changing gears a little bit and maybe putting Billy on the spot a little bit, but uh, you work for Jerry and with Jerry. So what's that like? It's awesome. I mean, the perspective that you get from working with somebody and that's been through that situation and pulled out of it is incredible. Um, do you want to go to break and we'll dive in afterwards? Yeah, I mean, uh, no, we can keep going. I like what you're, I want to hear what you have to say. So go ahead. Yeah. The, opportunity there was I so I left Fred Myers I was going to school full-time as a software developer um, I ended up getting hired full-time as a software developer and found although that was something that I wanted to do all my life and what I thought was going to be my path found that it wasn't something I was interested in um, I was working from home working by myself and then from being in customer service kind of all my life, I realized that I needed some of that social interaction in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of switched gears when I took the position with Jerry. And what Jerry was looking for somebody who was looking to grow and learn while working um, for him and move into that position. Um, and so we found that we were a good team together for what he wanted to, to accomplish. and. I saw all the benefit that would come from working for somebody like Jerry, somebody who's made it out from that object of poverty into a you know, running successful business. Um, so not only the business lessons that I learned from hearing his stories and, and everything on the daily, but you get that perspective as well. As you, even though I didn't have to go through that kind of poverty, I understand more of what's possible in the world and what can happen if you make the wrong decisions and all the rest. Um, so I feel like a lot of that perspective rubs off on me, which is awesome. Yeah, that's Lucky awesome. Lucky spot so. to be in. And yeah. Billy wasn't, uh, uh, the thing about hiring Billy is I put an ad out and I don't know how many, I don't know how many resumes I got, but like 40 or something, uh, when I put the ad out for the job. And I narrowed it down to, I think I had six interviews out of the 40. And of the six, I brought back three for a second interview that I really liked. Billy was the least qualified of all of the people. So this, again, goes to business and success and risk and mm -hmm. chances. 
on paper, he was the least qualified for what I needed. Certainly smart enough to do it, but the least qualified. Yeah. But as he sat down and the kind of effort he put into uh, the interviews and the work that, that he did just getting in front of me, I was like, what he doesn't know, that dude's going to learn. I gotta, he, he has to work for me. Right. And this goes back to success again. It's not always what, you, what the piece of paper that you have says and what right. school you went to and what experience you did because I had a lot of resumes in front of me right. uh, with a lot of people with a lot of experience and I took the least experienced guy and anybody, we've done hundreds of podcasts now and anybody will tell you Billy's as good as it gets. Um, and to his, I just made the correct decision he he makes me look good by by <laughs> by coming through the way that he did. Right. But you know, it's not always about about who has all of the skills and who's got the right uh, diploma. Sometimes you just have to go by that gut feeling, right? Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. So I think we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, when we come back, I'd like to uh, dive into Jerry's perspective on uh, what you think about people trying to get rich quick these days, and. Uh, and then we can uh, jump into what Portland and all the things that we love about Portland, the city that we love and, you know, live in. So uh, we'll be right back. Have you ever thought about flipping your own home? Need to sell but cannot afford the repairs? We, we have, have the, the solution, solution for, for you. you. With our Flip Your Own Home program, we can help you maximize your full potential profit. For a free, no obligation, 15-minute consultation, call or text us today at 503-382-7798. Jerry and Billy and of course John and I are going to jump into uh, the next question which I'm super excited to dive into very relevant with what's going on today um, social media and people uh, trying to get rich quick so um, I want to hear your take on that and and how we can help people understand well, first that it's of all, can you really, get rich quick yeah that's a great question there are start. a few things that I know empirically I always have to pay taxes <laughs> the sun's going to come up and it's going to go down yep. and you cannot get rich quick. So those are the few things that I know that are absolutely empirical. Not legally, at least. Not legally, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, you can win. Oh, There's a whole different section. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. You can win the lottery, uh, you know, I suppose, but that's not even... I'm talking about... I, I, I think I getting... There's a mentality behind... I think getting rich quick and entrepreneurship has gotten... Uh, muddled, right? Mm -hmm. It's been confused. And it's been confused because society shows us that uh, getting rich quick is becoming a billionaire uh, app developer or Facebook right. or Google. Um, that's who, or, or a celebrity, and that's who the rich are. And that's not who the rich are in the United States. The rich are you and I, guys that just work all day long, the small business owners in the U.S. And again, I said earlier, I think the average business is about two years. Maybe to make it to five years is like 20%. The numbers are against you to even start a business. But it's the right. guy down the street that owns three McDonald's that's the millionaire. That's the rich right. guy that you see. Uh, and I can guarantee you that guy's got 10, 12, 15, 20 years into it before he's gotten anything. The average business size in the United States is about $600,000 a year. They're making on average a 7% profit margin, right? So it takes time. It takes effort, energy, risk. Um, and so if someone's, the way you know that, you, that, that, that what someone's trying to sell you uh, is not true is if they're trying to sell you that you can get rich quick. I belong to these boards on, on, on Facebook and it, it just drives these groups and it drives me insane because it'll be, you know, millionaire mindset type groups. Shh, plug there for our group. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have to go to Facebook, Jerry Bracey, millionaire mindset. No, successful mindset. Or successful mindset, I'm sorry. Millionaire mindset is another one. No, I screwed that up. But the million, where the questions that you'll get is I have $5,000, how do I turn it into a million this year? I mean, it's not even a real number, right? right? And so you have all of these gurus that are running around telling everybody. I think it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's everywhere right now because of social media. You yes. see people trading, stock, um, 
Yes. There's so many things. Day that trading. You can advertise that kind of stuff. It the is. Guru, the, you know, and then make it look schemes. like it's working and you're just killing it. I mean, you're just showing a highlight of your life, right? You're doing pretty pictures. You're yeah. showing all these things. And so I think it's really, um, it's a mis- it's deceiving to think that everyone can go out there and just do that. Right. And um, I think it's hard on people right now to think that what am I doing wrong or what can I do or, you know, how do you jump into the getting to that next level without this idea that you're going to get rich really really quick yeah it just know that it doesn't exist that's that's the answer to that and that mm-hmm. all of these things take hard work and they take risk if those two I, I mean and you could you could you could take hard work and say time right. so they take hard work time and risk if you're not doing those three things the chances of you being successful are slim to none I mean we all know John and I know lots of rich guys those three things are what define who they are right um, and that's if you're if if your definition of success that's is monetary right right because yeah. there's other definitions of success too again that I think socially and social media in particular but popular culture mm-hmm. has kind of uh, screwed for the rest of us is again back to where I come from graduating from high school is an event all three of my kids graduated right. from high school that's an event for my gener- you know, for my lineage uh, yeah. and where I come from. That, to me, if I did nothing, if I yeah. worked at McDonald's my whole life, my kids graduating from high school, yeah. uh, is, would, would be my definition of success. The fact that they've gone on to do other things is even Still better. It took you hard work. Yeah, correct. And yeah. risk. In and of itself. So the stuff maybe that some take for granted, others need to show and see as being successful in their own. Hold a job down. I say go to work for a month. Don't miss a day yeah. for a month. And yeah, then don't miss small. a day for six months, right? Set that challenge to yourself. It's not going to get you a Lamborghini, but you're being successful. I say if on a scale of one to ten, let's say going to work every day for a month moves you to a two. Mm-hmm. And then pretty soon six months moves you to a three. And pretty soon after a year, you've gone to work every day. Now you're really kind of a four and a five going, what the hell was I doing as a one? Right. Right. How, did, how was sense. I ever a one? Yeah, like so that, that perspective changes. And that's... That's success. And then you can start to, you have to have that groundwork underneath you. You got to have that foundation, I think, and build that up to a five or to a six, Mm -hmm. to a seven, to really start to cultivate then the kind of success that you want, the fancier car, the bigger house, the more money. Without that foundation underneath you, though. Yeah, you can't fast forward on the foundation. Correct. If you can't not work 30 days straight, you have zero chance. I don't care what the internet tells you. It's never going to happen. True. You can show me examples of it happening. I get it. But they <laughs> are. They, they say you can show me yeah. the lottery. Somebody winning the lottery, too, and they're equally as rare. So yeah. Even the people that win the lottery, though, lose they, their money because it's a money. mindset. Correct. Right? You, you know, didn't earn they didn't, it. That's you right. You did not put in that foundation work to get there. That's so. right. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. the hard thing, too, about it's why I love the podcast and my own pod, the Jerry Brazy podcast, and doing this uh, these podcasts here because I get to talk about you know, McDonald's, when I go through the drive through uh, at a McDonald's and I get asked and I'm driving some fancy car, I have a big car collection, uh, and inevitably it's always the teenage guys that are asking me, you know, what do you do for a living? Right. And I'm like, I used to be where you are. I worked the drive through window yeah, when I was 16 years old at McDonald's. That's what I do for a living. That's where I come from. I have no education. I have no college. I have nothing but, I love that. but this right here. And I did all of those jobs. And so it helps to understand because it's easy to see the car. It's easy to see the big house. It's easy to see the, yeah, the video and all of that stuff. It's hard to see the 40 years of hard work. And the yeah. heartbreak and the loss. And Nobody the sees that. Nobody's posting that on moments. Instagram. I once worked eight straight days on a 45-minute nap on the third day. Oh, wow. My, yeah, my no. crew went home every 20, worked 20 <laughs> hours and went home for four me. hours. So <laughs> my wife, I got home on the eighth day. My wife will tell you she made me dinner. I ate dinner, and then I couldn't sleep. So I was good through about six days. Seven and eight was really tough. But I mean, it, that's my largest competitor went out of business. I hired 55 people in 30 days for a company at the time I had about 50. So I doubled in size and I doubled in revenue. I'm sitting here today because of that bankruptcy by that national competitor in 2001. Two years later, I was a millionaire. Wow. That's impressive. So, I mean, that's, that's what it takes. Yeah. That's I love the kind of things story. that it takes. I absolutely love it. It's inspiring. It's, do you have any other yeah. questions? Because I think I want to ask Jerry a little bit about... Go ahead. Do you ahead. have any other? Yeah. No, ask, no? Him, ask, ask so away. Where we like, so we're going to jump into Portland here and uh, all the things that we love about Portland, right? Um, all things Portland. That's this podcast. So 
Um, Valentine's Portland podcast. We will start out. I mean, it's a foodie town. Mm-hmm. We're known for having great chefs and people coming here and starting out as a food cart and turning it into restaurants. Um, where are your go-to spots? Uh, what what restaurants are you hoping to pull through this pandemic? And so my favorite one uh, we lost. So oh. I was a, an original taco house guy. Oh yeah. yeah. There was one on Powell and yeah. one out on eighty <laughs> second. Anybody <laughs> outside of Portland original taco house was in. I, re- was I here remember the first, first time in my the sixties original taco house. Yeah, and so from the time my kids were little. Uh, we would go in there. I used to go in there because it was cheap mm-hmm. when I was a kid. So, you know, it's one of those things that you recognize as a kid. And then when I had children, uh, since they were very little, I mean, before some of them were born, we would go in there. And the, the waitresses in particular were the same waitresses. And so then by the time my kids, my boys are both six foot four, gigantic, but they were this tall. And the waitresses watched them grow up and every time they would give them trouble and all that. So we had a relationship with that yeah. place. It closed on New Year's Day here Years back. Three, four Coming years down. ago. Yeah, yeah. And it really left a hole for us because we were so used to to going all of the time. So yeah, that was a magical place for a lot of people. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was mine if I if I had to pick one was uh, was original yeah. Taco House. Yeah, and now that's if a I good had one. and then uh, now um, I don't eat a ton of because I'm, I, 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 I try to eat well, but uh, my splurge would be uh, Super Burrito in Milwaukee. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Again, I'm everybody. very yeah. simple, right? I'm, I'm a kid <laughs> from the streets, man. I, 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 I keep it real simple. So you just give me a giant chicken burrito and yeah. uh, and a Mountain Dew, and I got a smile on my face. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about you, Billy? Yeah. So mine would be Jake's Grill. Jake's uh, Grill down yeah. here, and it's especially for where I'm at in life. It's awfully pricey for for our budget. I was gonna say, oh, Jake's Grill. <laughs> He's fancy. I throw a burrito out there. Yeah, no. talking Jake's Grill. <laughs> So I was going, maybe I'm paying him too much. <laughs> Thumbs up there. Yep. I don't eat out a whole lot, um, but me and the girlfriend, we like to save up, and then on our, you know, anniversaries or a big occasion, we'll go out to a nice place and get, you know, an expensive meal, and we nice. both love seafood, and yep. that's one of the best seafood places I've Yeah, nice. this is great. I love Absolutely. their happy hour. Yeah, they They've got a great hour. happy hour, too, so. I'll give you one more, too. Yeah. I'm a pool player. I love to play pool. I was going to ask you about pool. Yes, I'm a huge pool player. And there is, uh, when I was a street kid uh, at 16 years old, I lived in Northeast Portland, and there's Sam's Billiards. It's been around since the 60s. It's one of the oldest pool halls around. It's in Northeast Portland. Uh, Sam's, if you're listening, you got trying to buy that place forever. <laughs> uh, and when I was, Sam is dead now, uh, but when I was 16, I would go in there, and it was a bar. They wouldn't, you know, you're not old enough yeah. to go in there, but he knew that I was a troubled kid and he would let me come in and play in a back corner table until the crowd came in at night wouldn't serve me drinks or anything right but he just was nice enough to to get me off the street Uh, and so Sam's Billiards of Food is you know it's bar food but it's fantastic and it's cheap and you get a ton and it's good quality and so for me again I'm a simple human being uh, not too complex here throw a burrito my way or go sit down at Sam's and have a big bacon cheeseburger and play some pool and and I'm a happy man so have you been able to play any pool because I know when the this pandemic first hit and we all got put on lockdown and yeah uh, you and I talked just to check in and you were like I miss playing pool man yeah. I want to play some pool yeah <laughs> so I have two buddies that I don't have a pool table I have two buddies that have pool tables and so I've had a regular gig on Thursday nights and I've had a fairly regular gig on Friday nights playing with uh, with my buddies but uh, it's not the same you know it's just it's not pool for me is a huge uh it's my getaway, yep. my release. Doesn't matter what's happening outside of that pool hall. I can have the world coming down on me. And as soon as I step inside there, man, nah, there's like nothing else happening. So yeah. for me, it's a you know I miss. Plus, I like the smell and the yeah. noise and you know. It's familiar. To I, again, I'm yeah. a pool hall guy. Yeah. That's hard to believe. Familiar. Based on my story. So I. Uh, that's very interesting. I love hearing that. I, had, I would have never guessed that. So John and I have something that we like to call the Portland package, right? Um, if you want to... The, the Portland yeah. package, kind of an inside uh, joke, joke, but uh, it uh, stems from uh, Jim's brother, actually. So he lives, our friend, mutual friend, lives in Lake Tahoe, and he would bring guests here, usually female, and he always had a package that he put together for them. And it was usually like three little 
special things about Portland. It just kind of, so we called it the Portland package. Sometimes it was the Cannon Beach package. And so, uh, you know, his package was the Cannon Beach package is he would always bring them here, take them to the Portland City Grill would be the first place, mm-hmm. you know, show off Portland a little bit and the views. And then he'd take them to Cannon Beach and show off the coast. And then he'd take them up to Multnomah Falls and show, you know, so that was kind of the, the package. So. Yeah, I give them a nice. So if you had to put name. together a Portland <laughs> package, what would kind of be well, your for three go to? Someone coming into town. Someone coming in and out of town to show off Portland and everything that Port living in Portland has to offer. Meaning, you know, yeah. how easy it is. What to are your highlights? Yeah. yeah, what are those three places you so take the, someone? I have I have family that live down in the south, Chattanooga, mm-hmm. Tennessee. And uh, they came here years ago, and I have a ranch over in Central Oregon at the time, uh, and so we were driving over, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, as I'm on my way there, did the drive a thousand times, I've lived here my whole life, they start going, oh, pull the car over, pull the car over, and I thought, what, I hit a dog or something? Yeah. Right? What's going on? <laughs> Somebody's going to throw up in the back. And I pull over, and they got out, and they just start taking pictures like mad, and they start videotaping, and it was Mount Hood. Yeah. yeah. I've driven over that mountain 500 times, right? A thousand times. Right. I've stared at it every day of my life. Yeah. To them, Mount Hood is it was like nothing they had ever seen before. Uh, and so I would say Mount Hood or Timberline because we have it. Yeah. Yeah, we have absolutely. it pretty easy here. You take it uh, for granted. Just driving yeah, down the street and seeing it. Right. The, the, we'll throw that in the repertoire. Yeah, <laughs> I think going up there, I didn't appreciate how much we have mountains. And most of the country does it, particularly east of the Rockies. Uh, and so for them, this thing was was something extraordinary. Yeah. Um, uh, do you mean in Portland? Just, yeah, just anything. So the Timberline, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is the walk down on, on Waterfront Park. That's always, yeah. Um, I think that's that's probably cool. And then for me, it's Oaks Park. Oh, Oaks yeah, Park? Yeah, because there's you nothing more Portland to me than Oaks Park. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. A, yeah, that's a good one. How so, about you? Do Mine would be food spot would be the montage. Oh yeah, uh, montage, down here. Yeah. You, get the, uh, you have to leave some on your plate so you can get it to go. Yep, because then they always <laughs> do the the fancy to go. Uh, the tin foil the animals. animals. I've never been. They got it's, a bunch of. Is there burritos over there? Yeah, <laughs> I don't I'm think sure they could wrap do. up a burrito. It's mostly for you. late night. People go there at two in the morning, yep. hammered, and and then when you get your to go mac and cheese, it's a uh, they make the tin foil into big swan and stuff. So all anyway. kinds of stuff. It's, it's yeah, you cool never experience. know where your animal is going to come out. Like, it's so. a lot of fun. Hopefully, um, we always tend to go hiking. Yep. Um, so if you actually cross over to the Washington side and you go up by Beacon Rock. Mm-hmm. Um, but oh, then I you that hike. turn off behind Beacon Rock, mm-hmm. and there's actually like 20 miles of hiking trails up mm-hmm. there. Um, but there's one specifically that you can take up. It's the equestrian trail, and it comes up to this point where you can just see all of the gorge. Is you it? Can, uh, do you have the name of the trail? Do you I don't it? off the yeah. top of my head. I, it's something Ridgeback, I know it's called, but you take the equestrian trail up, and it's right there behind it. Um, but you come up to this ridge that's just a... It's a beautiful view out down the gorge and all of Portland, and it's yeah. just an awesome place. I think that's um, one of the things I've loved most about coming, being a transplant from evil California. No, yeah. not evil. Yeah. <laughs> Christina moved here from I Southern know, California. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Don't push she, me she away. She got the Multnomah Falls package. So. Yeah. Yeah. I got, well, I got, yes, I got the packages, but um, it is true. We take it for granted what we have here, and that's why we're asking this, because we've got so many beautiful things here that, yeah. um, you know, summertime, green trees, it's blazing hot outside, and yet it's still green everywhere, and we have rivers and the beach and the mountains. I, and I have the friends desert. that live all over the country, and uh, they I don't know that they believe me until they've come here and done it. I don't think that there is a better spot in the United States to spend summer than Portland, Oregon. That's how I got here. I mean, I just don't feel think, a little you know, fooled. The, I came the, the during August, summertime. I gave her the August sneak attack, and she's like, it's beautiful. It's always yeah. like this. It's, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, you yeah. know, again, it starts about now. It won't rain until October for the most yeah. part, you know, and then it's there's no bugs. The humidity is low. You get, yeah. you know, 85 average temperatures. I, I don't know why you would live. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we don't get uh, we don't get near the rain that uh, the southern states do. We don't get near the rain that Seattle does because right. we're kind of protected. Absolutely. We get this, the, the clouds that come in, and that's what gives us the bad reputation. But if that keeps the people away, uh, all the better. But I don't think there's a better place to be from, from middle of May until middle of October. 
I in the whole United, United States. Yeah. I think this it is, is it. pretty magical. Yeah. And we have everything. I mean, we have a glacier up there, so you can go snowboarding year round. Yes. You have water all sports. Around, yeah. You have the beach a couple hours away. You got hiking, hiking all over. Yeah. So. I mean, the list goes on. Those are the main ones, but there's more out there. Mm-hmm. Billiards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Billiards. Yeah. Cool. Sam's a lot billiards. Of cool yeah. <laughs> Sam's billiards. So I think it's time for us to take another break here. Um, and when we come back, we're going to jump into uh, Portland real estate and what's going on uh, today in the real estate world. You want the absolute best for yourself and you want it to be easy. That's why we created Green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently. But we're proud it's chemical free, unlike almost all other supplements you'll find. Bottom line. Green 85 will get you healthier. We look forward to hearing what Green 85 did for you. To get this product and our other amazing products, go to chemicalfreebody.com. That's chemicalfreebody.com. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Jerry and Billy, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Portland real estate market today. So, Jerry and Billy, I have history with both of you and uh, been Portland real estate and, uh, currently with you right now and in the past and uh, helped Billy buy his first investment property. So, anyway, what do you what do you guys see in the market right now? Um, how do you, as you know, not obviously Christina and I are in the business, so. You know what? How, what's your perception of the market right now, especially with everything that's going on in the in the world right now? I've been kind of off the pulse for a little bit. Um, after I purchased the investment property, I haven't been watching the market as closely as I was when I was actively looking for a property. Um, but I would say that I mean, rents are like crazy here still, even to today, and even the pulse that I have gotten on the market. Um, during COVID and everything else, it hasn't fallen as much as I would expect it to. Yeah. I mean, as soon as kind of all of this hit, I mean, we were talking and start getting that savings ready because the house buying season is coming. Yeah, and absolutely. it's been surprising how well it's held on and how well prices have still kept up. Um, I think Portland is kind of in that, that right spot where everybody wants to be. And there's so many people moving here that it's helping keeping the prices up of of homes in the local area. Um, but as an investment property, Jerry helped me and, and you uh, to get into that first property, understand how purchasing an investment property can work as a, as a, as a business and as an investment um, to have that rental. And it, it worked out well in this local area. Yeah, so on our last show, we talked a little bit about that being kind of the, the best, not, you know, not necessarily the best, but one of the best, which I agree with, uh, investments for a first-time buyer is that duplex yep. can live on one side, and you're living proof of that. Tell us a little bit about your experience with that. You're, you're living on one side, and you're yeah. living out the other side, and how's it, that going for you? It's a huge benefit as a first-time investor slash property manager is to be able to really be in the thick of it. I mean, I'm there, I see my tenant every day, and it it gives you a lot of ability to monitor the situation and stay current on the situation, but also it comes with responsibility of not overdoing it. Because, um, I mean, I had 30 people look at the, the apartment when I put it up for rent, and you'd be surprised how many scoffs I got when they found out I lived right next door. Not always. Just kidding, don't want to be next to the landlord. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's a balance there, but I. I'd say it's one of the best situations for me to learn the process and learn how to be a good landlord and what to take care of and what all that entails and everything yeah. else. Um, I love that. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that you were living on the other side. What yep. What neighborhood did you purchase in? I'm out in Gresham. Very good. Um, but there is, I mean, all the landlord stuff has happened. So day after Christmas, I got a four day notice that my tenant was breaking lease and moving. Um, you know, that headed into a couple of months of repair and rehab, uh, to get the unit up. And we actually switched sides during that time. So we moved as well. 
Yeah. Um, and then getting it back up on the market, which, I mean, middle of winter, trying to rent a place, it was its own uh, battle or trying to get that going. But I had a great response to it. Um, I've had a good mentor here. I was going to put it up for way too cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's good. Yeah. The, 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 the neat thing about podcasts like this, and you can learn anything on the internet, and anybody looking to get into real estate like Billy did, Billy mm-hmm. was 26 when you bought it? Yep. 26 when you bought it. He was scared to death. All right. right. I and, think and originally he was over in Vancouver and John hooked us up with his buddy over there. And how many times you get turned down? How many times did places get bought out from underneath you? At least six or seven. Six or seven. Then he came over here, tried to get some places, just had the same luck. Uh, and I remember him coming into my office and going, I don't, it's just not for me. I don't think it's going to, you know, we got turned down again. And do you remember what I tell you? Just keep going. Just keep trying, yeah. man. Keep that going, house yeah. will be there for you. And yep. had he bought... It all any, makes sense in the end. That's what I try and tell everybody. It always seems to always make sense. Had he uh-huh. bought... He did not look at any house, any duplex, nearly as good as the one he ended up buying. That one right. was spectacular. The one he bought was extraordinary. It was, um, it was good that he had you as a mentor because, you know, it's hard to... Especially with first-time buyers a lot of times to tell them, look... You're going to have to pay over full price for yeah. this thing. And it's a good deal because, you know, coming from an agent, sometimes it can sound self-serving. Like, yeah, right. I get paid. So if you do it. So right. yeah. I knew that one was a great deal. Yeah. And, and and you did, too, once I kind of explained it to you. Yeah. That was just a hard, hard to find deal. And so. And that's the critical. It's worked out for you. So that's the thing, too, really. about it is find a mentor, find somebody uh, that you trust uh, to help you because it's been fun. His perspective on buying that place, uh, I'll use this word because I don't have a better one, but it's just kind of cute. You, know? <laughs> you and I do this all day long, you know. Is it so, rejuvenating? Like, yeah, yeah, that, yeah because he's like, he's worried about yeah. renting it. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> he's going to, well, I told you you were going to get 20, you got like 30. I was wrong. Yeah. He comes in with this off or with this the, his rental price I was like are you nuts but again not that I know everything I've just made those mistakes yeah. right. and so then I get to help him go and as it turned out we were too cheap even with my inflated number we were still, still too cheap, cheap so I made the mistake um, but yeah so it's fun for me but for him and for anybody looking to get into the real estate side find somebody you can trust because there's a game to it yeah. um, that needs to be played and and it's not what it looks like on the outside and not what you thought it was uh, find somebody that knows how the game's played who has connections like I do with John uh, and mm-hmm. then you just do the best you can in this case like John said we way overpaid overpaid relative to what they were asking but it's Paid off and it's it's a fantastic piece of property. It, it was one of the funnest transactions. I think we talked about it on yeah. your guys' podcast. It was rejuvenating to me. Like it mm-hmm. was a very, it was just a lot of fun working with him and helping him get into that because I knew it was such a good deal. And you know, for lack of that better word, it was cute. And yeah, he was so excited about it. How nervous right. he was. Yeah, ner- you know, like, all those things. things. A lot of emotions like go through. I mean, Absolutely. The most expensive thing I bought up to that point was a five thousand dollar motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm buying a $400,000 house. Right. It's, it's, right. A, big it's jump, a big right? jump. Yeah. And, and you don't understand the process. I mean, even though you've walked it through me several times and I've done all the research and reading online, it's, you know, at what point do I not get my $5,000 I put down back if, if I decide yeah. to go the other way? Or at what point, you know, when I write that, that sign that paper, let it's mine and there's no turning back, you know, yeah. and it's, it's understanding all of those things as you go through the process and having people around you to help coach you through it and it's going to be okay. And you can ask the same question 10 times over. Yeah. yeah. It. You know, that's not, un- it's not uh, uncommon for only, a first time home buyer or even second time home buyer. Only so. dumb people don't ask dumb questions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's and when true. you're buying a house, that's a hundred percent true. And then the other thing about it's important to find somebody is particularly like in Billy's case and for most people, because it's such a big purchase, it's very emotional. Mm-hmm. And the more emotional you are, the worse it is. I, as a broker, yeah. you guys, sure. I know you know that all too well. So it's important to find somebody who can kind of be that steady. I don't know how many times he came in freaking about something. And I was like, why are you talking to me about this? That's nothing. What, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Here's what it means. Stop worrying about it and go sit yeah. back down. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a part of our job to keep the emotions yeah. in check and just let you know this is all part of the process. 
it's not anything that's just happening to you. It happens to everybody. And, and in the end, I always say it makes sense when you get that house and you get those keys. It always ends up being the perfect home for you. And um, well, not a hundred percent always, you know, but for, um, you know, for the most for part, for the most part, yeah. Real estate's a long term game, and um, you're gonna win as long as you have that in mind. So. The bigger the purchase, the less emotion. That's what I say. That's a great. Yeah, houses, businesses, doesn't matter what it is. The bigger the purchase, the less you want to do it emotionally. And attached right. to the outcome. Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. How about you guys? Since you're in the market, have you noticed a big change since all of this has happened? Yeah, so I think uh, absolutely I have. And so and it's, you know, nothing horrible, but we have seen, uh, it, you know, it, it seems like the whole market went on a pause like the rest of the world right up right yeah. front. But at that same time, there was still, because interest rates are so low right mm-hmm. now, three and a half percent or less, inventory in Portland's very low and it will continue to be. And so prices have held steady. Um, some of the lower end buyers, 500 and under, we're still out buying. Some, you know, it was up and down. Some totally went on pause, like just we're, we're holding off because we're scared. We don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Others lost their jobs. You know? yeah, so they couldn't buy. It. They went from they're ready to buy that they just couldn't anymore. Some got furloughed, and now they're coming back into the market because their job's coming back. And so um, seen a little, you know, it's been up and down. But overall, the market has stayed strong. Prices are still up in Portland. And uh, just this last week or so, it's kind of started getting real busy again. So I think that spring buying market kind of just got pushed back a couple months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I think the Portland market's going to continue to be strong. And, you know, Jerry's Jerry's done a lot of development, so he Mm -hmm. understands how hard it is to develop in in Portland and the surrounding areas. And that's just going to continue to keep our inventory low. And, and like you said, people want to move here because it's such a great place. And so we've got an influx of people moving here. And, and, uh, and so the combination of all that, that our, our market's going to continue to be strong, yeah. I, I believe. Yeah, it's going to probably, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that have just been sitting back waiting that have every intent of buying too. And they just put the pause button on. So when play starts up again, there's going to be a lot more. It's been competitive already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, under 450 we've been going up against multiple offers uh, getting outbid so when everybody decides it's time to move forward again it's probably going to get even busier and you know upwards of 10 I mean we saw 10 17 offers on a couple homes um, written in this time yeah, and it's just hard to imagine offers, like, yeah. you know? and the duplex that I got was within I think two days three days there was probably six offers on the home yeah there were several offers Which and is, the, the one went right into backup so yep. and actually they were there when we did the inspection yeah right? they, yeah. they walked they to the were home ready. <laughs> they were ready they were ready they were ready they were ready for you they were they were there I mean, right? that's the way yeah. to do it though show your you face know? you got to so yeah I mean, how about you, Jerry? Where, where do you? What neighborhood do you live in? Uh, I live out in Damascus, so I live way out in uh, in in southeast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I think the 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 market. I, I don't disagree with John. Uh, I have one hundred fifty thousand square feet of industrial space, mm-hmm. um, uh, commercial and industrial space, and that market's all but flatlined. Got it. Uh, so. You know, but that makes sense. Businesses aren't doing anything. People don't want to move. Right. Uh, landlords don't want to do lease improvements. Um, so um, that has has quieted down for the most part. But yeah, to, to John's point, the de- development in Portland and the surrounding area is just about as difficult as you're going to find it short of uh, Southern California or uh, in New York. It's just a. It's really a. A slog. It's a nightmare, mm-hmm. um, and so I think that that lends itself to the market being this way because it's to to to, to the market carrying itself out because it's so hard to build. It's yeah. it's just so difficult to bring those that new uh, houses to 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 market, and then you have the the urban growth boundary, yep, yeah. which is which, which kind of has built in security. Uh, inside of it, so yeah, I don't. I, I I think the people. It's just a matter of time before they come back. I mean, I think nationally, recession and depression and all of those things, as we're spending all this money, may have an impact over and above what the local market is. You know, mm-hmm. you get impacted by the federal market. That probably worries me more than anything. Is 
just where we're going with all this and then the impact that's going to have on on real estate. But I'd still pick real estate over, go buy real estate. You know, if you have $20,000 in the bank, call John, uh, go get an FHA loan and buy a house because that 20 grand at the rate they're printing money is going to be worth nothing. I mean, they're printing trillions of dollars. Right. Into, you know, your 20 grand in the bank is going to be worth five grand. Go buy a house. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, would, I, I, could, I feel like we could talk about this all Three day. Three and a half percent interest. 2.85 if you get a 15 year rate like that's, that's right. pretty inexpensive money. So. Yeah, that's that's and, and then what FHA is 3%, 4% down? Yeah, 3.5% so down. You got 15 15 grand that's I'm pretty can, passionate about yeah, like 20 some. Yeah. I wish more 20 some would get out there and buy and just realize wh- how that just sets you apart moving forward if you hang on to that piece of property and invest in it and then you can refinance, take money out, buy that second home down the road and just Sounds slowly familiar. build your real estate portfolio. I, I just wish more people understood the power in that. People don't understand how much money you can get. I mean, what 3% means. You know, if you yeah. had $10,000 or $15,000, it's going to be close enough to get you into a $300,000 house. Um, and so that's number one. And number two, the other thing is I bought my first house at 21 years old. I had no idea what a mortgage was. I had no idea what interest rates were. I didn't have any idea. It just kind of fell in my lap I, I paid 12 percent interest i didn't even mm-hmm. know what that meant yeah uh and i used that house three times to refinance my business to yeah. keep it alive over the next decade absolutely so having no idea what a refi was yeah. I, I mean i knew again i was functionally Seven. illiterate i knew nothing when i came out yeah. and uh and to your point i fell into getting this house bought and i bought it at 21 and i'm sitting here there yeah that's so i agree example. wholeheartedly with yeah. you yeah so, so we got to start wrapping up a little bit, but just wanted to kind of uh, let you guys take some parting words. And I know you guys do your own uh, podcast, and it's the Jerry Brazy Show, correct? Jerry Brazy Podcast. Jerry Brazy Podcast. Yeah. And so if you want to tell us a little bit about that. So real quick, the Jerry Brazy Podcast is about uh, a few years ago, I said I needed to figure out, this was probably a decade ago, 10 years ago, I needed to figure out a way, I was going to try to give back, mm-hmm. right? How, how, born and raised here, how do I give back? here and for me when I was Christmas is a big deal when I was a kid we would get sugar cereal wrapped in in Christmas wrap that was our Christmas present wow. now to me that was the biggest Christmas present you could ever want I didn't want anything more Score. I got Christmas <laughs> yeah. I got sugar cereal uh, and so it always left an imprint on me that it was that, that Christmas was a big deal and so I said I'm gonna I'm gonna find a family and I'm gonna kind of just adopt the family somebody down on their luck and I'm gonna make sure their kids have Christmas and so I went to four families, three of them. I had got, got a, an agency to help me find them. I said, I want to interview them first. Uh, I found them. I went to the house. It's Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock, and the dads are sitting there playing video games, three of the four interviews. And I was like, nope, I can't. I just can't yeah. in good faith help why this guy doesn't have two jobs. I don't understand. Right. I'm not going to help. So then I kind of backed off because it gave a bad taste in my mouth. And I said, you know what? Here a couple years ago, I said, I think I can kind of give back by teaching and so teaching what I know where I come from what I've done Mm -hmm. if we've helped businesses all over the country because I encourage people to call me Uh, so you know you don't have to I don't take any money for it I'm not you know I could charge seven hundred thousand dollars an hour if I wanted to for my advice Mm -hmm. again I've done millions of dollars of financing packages and building and real estate transportation you name it I've done it Um, so I can help and I have helped all Mm -hmm. over uh, but I do it giving back um, and so the podcast is really just about me talking about myself and giving perspective on life from, you know, through my eyes. Uh, I always say to people, if you could look through my eyes for one minute, you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish. I think I see more in people than they see in themselves yeah. uh, simply because of where I came from. So for me, that's kind of the point of the pod. Now we have fun and have a good time. Yeah. And I'd be you know, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say my ego wasn't involved. I get to, you know, share and do all of that. But it's some self-serving. But really, I'm just trying to tell people what's possible, either where they came from uh, or if they came from where I came from or wherever they are mm-hmm. in life. And they whatever they want to do, here's what's possible. Here's some perspective. Here's how I did it. Um, if there's something to be learned from that, great. So that's really the genesis of the podcast is just trying to tell stories, help people out. We comment on current events and perspectives awesome. and things like that. Giving back your knowledge. That's, yeah. that's important. Yeah, so. right. Exactly right. Well, thank you very much for coming on our show today. Absolutely. Jerry and Billy. Yes, and, thank uh, you guys. We, we appreciate it very day. much. Yeah.
Perfect. Until next time. You're welcome. Thank Jerry Crazy Podcast. Go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank Have you a great so day. much for listening today.